I am going to talk to you about indicators and status of women globally. This module is designed for master's students of women's development and empowerment. It will help you understand the status of women from a broad spectrum of indicators and see how the status of Indian women compares with the rest of the world. Ancient literature tells us that women enjoyed equal status with men. This situation gradually changed due to political, economic and cultural dynamics. Wars, invasion and revolutions happening in various parts of the world also strongly influenced the status of women. When we talk of status, we could be talking from different perspectives. By going through this module, we will be talking from the same page. It was only in the second half of the 20th century that definite parameters were evolved to understand the status of women within the overall development paradigm. In order to make global comparisons, the parameters were standardized which permit us to see the position of each country or a region in relation to the rest of the world. In this module, we will look at the some selected parameters which are crucial to determine the status of women. For example, health and nutritional status, educational status, political participation, economic status, empowerment and violence against women. We are learning this module so that we understand the various global indices of women's development, understand how India ranks globally with respect to gender equality and thirdly India's progress as of 2015 on the Millennium Development Goals. What are indicators of women's development? Indicator is a parameter selected to indicate a specific outcome which represents progress. Periodic measurements of these indicators will reflect the changes achieved over time. The indicators selected should be available, valid, reliable, precise and measurable. A single indicator can provide a simple piece of information. In order to capture a holistic picture, you need a set of related indicators which are used to prepare an index which is a composite indicator. In this exercise, weightage is provided to each indicator depending on its influence on the larger picture based on sound statistical approaches. While composite indicators have the capacity to summarize multi-dimensional issues, they do have certain limitations which we need to understand. Let us examine some of these composite indicators. Gender Parity Index, in short form we call it GPI. It's a socio-economic index developed by UNESCO. It measures the relative access to education between males and females. It is calculated as the proportion of the number of females by the number of males enrolled at a given level of education. Now you have the Education for All Development Index, EDI. The EFA Development Index, which can assess the overall performance of a country in relation to gender specific EFA indicators. The index includes primary adjusted net enrollment ratio, that is the number of pupils in the school age group for primary education, enrolled either in primary or secondary education, expressed as a percentage of the total population in that age group. Secondly, we look at literacy rate for persons who are below 15. Thirdly, we look at gender specific EFA index GEI, an average of the gender parity indices GPI of the primary and secondary gross enrollment ratios and the adult literacy rate and the survival rate of grade 5. Gender Empowerment Measure GEM. According to UNDP, GEM can measure how women and men are able to participate in economic and political life and take part in decision making. GEM is based on three indicators, namely proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments, secondly percentage of women in economic decision making positions, that is women in administrative, 
management, professional and technical jobs. Thirdly, women's share of income in relation to men. While women's empowerment is women's participation in economic life in all sectors, GEM has the limitation of being unable to capture the entire spectrum of women's empowerment. Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, WEAI. This was evolved by the United States Agency for International Development, the USAID, and the International Food Policy Research, IFPRI, and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative of the Oxford University in 2012. This new index focuses on women who play a large role in agriculture, particularly developing countries, yet face a number of constraints. It includes indicators such as decision on agricultural activities, agricultural income, control over the land and livestock, and leadership in community, and time use. Women will be considered to be empowered if they have achieved four of the five areas. It also looks at empowerment of women in relation to men. This is being piloted in three countries and preliminary results show that uh, in measuring women's empowerment in agriculture. Gender Inequality Index GII developed by UNDP. This measure uses three dimensions again, namely reproductive health, maternal mortality ratio MMR, that is the ratio of the number of maternal deaths while pregnant or within 42 days of 100,000 live births during the same period and adolescent fertility rate, the AFR, the number of births per 1,000 adolescent girls in the age group of 15 to 19. Second, empowerment of women's share of parliament seats and higher education and women's participation in the labor market. Next you have the Gender Equity Index, GEI. It was developed by the Social Watch in 2004 focusing on socio-economic opportunities. It ranks 157 countries by measuring three dimensions of gender inequality such as education, economic participation and empowerment. The limitation of this index is that it only looks at a socio-economic aspects and ignores important aspects such as health. Let's look at the Global Gender Gap Index, the GGP. The World Economic Forum since 2006 has been able to quantify the extent of gender-based disparities between men and women. The index uses outcome indicators such as health and survival sex ratio at birth and the ratio of female life expectancy over male. Educational achievement, which is the ratio of female literacy rate to male literacy rate ratio of female net primary enrollment over male and ratio of female net secondary enrollment rate over male, ratio of female gross tertiary enrollment over male. That is the three levels of education achievement. Economic dimension is that the ratio of female labor participation in relation to men, ratio of estimated female income over male income, ratio of female legislators over men, ratio of female professional and technical workers over men and political dimension that is a ratio of females with seats in the parliament in relation to men, ratio of females at the ministerial level over male and the ratio of the number of years of female head of state in the last 50 years over the male. Now we have the social institutions and gender index CG. The OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in 2007, introduced an index called the Social Institutions and Gender Index. This index focuses on social institutions that have an impact on the equality of women and men. They include the four dimensions of discriminatory family code, whether women and men have the same legal age of marriage. The women and men have the same authority to be the legal guardian of a child during marriage, custody rights over a child after divorce, whether widows and widowers have the same rights of inheritance, whether daughters and sons have equal inheritance rights. 
restricted physical integrity whether the legal framework provides uh, protection for women against domestic violence rape and sexual harassment the percentage of women who agree that a husband or a partner is justified in beating the wife or partner in certain circumstances percentage of women who have experienced physical or sexual violence from their intimate partner percentage of women who have undergone genital mutilation percentage of married women in the age group 15 to 49 who have unmet need for family planning son buyers captured through the missing women that is the sex ratios in the age groups 0 to 4 5 to 9 10 to 14 and 15 to 64 and above 65 and fertility preferences fourth is the restricted ownership of assets and resources whether women and men have equal access to land and non land assets and control and ownership of land and other assets and access to financial institutions restricted civil liberties whether women have restrictions to move about freely in public places whether women have quotas to promote their political participation at various levels and a share of women in national parliaments this index provides strong evidence of gender discrimination and is calculated for 160 countries next we go on to gender related development index the gdi it's a human development index used to measure gender equality gdi is corrected by the gender inequalities it looks at gender gaps in education school enrollment adult literacy life expectancy and income gdi and gem were introduced in 1995 by the united nations development program the undp in the human development report this has added the gender sensitive dimension to the human development index it also creates a penalty score for gender gaps the gdi cannot be seen in isolation from the human development index the hdi one has to look at the gap between hdi and gdi let's understand the human development index hdi it is created by the indian economist amartya sen and pakistani economist mohabbub ul haq and the undp in 1990 hdi is calculated on three aspects including life expectancy education and income using single indicators for each aspect this simplicity permits hdi ranking for all the countries into different levels of human development although globally applicable the insufficient indicators used for hdi is likely to be subject to prejudice the global hunger index ghi has been calculated by the international food policy research institute the ifpri since 2006 this is a multi dimensional index and includes three indicators with equal weightage that is the proportion of undernourished in proportion to the total population secondly the underweight children under the age of 5 and thirdly the under 5 mortality countries with zero score have no hunger and those who with score of 100 are the worst affected by hunger and you have countries with different ranks in between 0 to 100 the correlation between the global hunger index and gender gap index show that uh, high rates of hunger are strongly linked to gender inequalities especially with regard to education and health now how do you decide which index to use you have learned that there are several indices and can be used to measure the status of women they measure different aspects of women's development you would have noticed that some indicators such as education and health are used to construct several indices such as the hunger index the human development index the gender related development index gender gap index or the gender equality index because of their strong influence on the status of women the selection of the index would depend on how and where you would like to apply and the kind of changes you would like to bring about in development field it depends entirely on the lens with which you want to look at it i would like to quote albert einstein he says not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts so you have to use your own uh, sense of logic when applying indicators 
Let's look at the status of women in India using global ranking. Let us see how India ranks in relation to the rest of the world with regard to some of the important indicators. First look at the health and nutritional status. Every third malnourished child in the world lives in India. Although there is no gender gap in the nutritional status between boys and girls, 40% of children less than 3 years are underweight. Comparing body mass index of women and men, we find that 33% women and 28% women have BMI less than the normal, showing gender inequality. Anemia is widely prevalent, that is 78.9% among children below 3 years and 56.2% among women and 24.3% among men in the age group 15 to 49. This is according to the NFHS data, third edition. Gender inequality index. India ranks 135 among 187 countries. Some of the challenges include, why do we have this gap? That's because we have high prevalence of HIV among 2.24 million people and the epidemic being feminized with more and more women being infected. GII data for 2010 shows that India has a maternal mortality rate of 200 when compared to some of the countries like Estonia with MMR of 2, Singapore and Greece with MMR of 3 and uh, the World Bank data for 2013 shows that the adolescent birth rate in India is 32 when compared to 2 in Switzerland, 1 in Slovenia and Korea. Global Gender Gap Index, the Global Gender Gap Index benchmarks the national gender gaps. This measure not only captures the sex ratio but also looks at the years lost in malnutrition, disease and violence. According to the ranking of the countries in 2014, India has an overall ranking of 114 among the 142 countries with regard to health and survival. India ranks 141 of the 142 countries included in the ranking of the countries with regard to the gender gap. India is one of the lowest ranking countries, sad to say. Gender Related Development Index. This index uses one indicator that is life expectancy at birth to reflect health status. For India, it is 68.3 for females and 64.7 for males according to the Human Development Report of 2030. The gap between female and male is only 3.6 years when compared to Japan. Women in India die 19 years earlier with a life expectancy of 87. For men in Japan, the life expectancy is 80, which indicate a 7-year gap between life expectancy between men and women. The index assumes that women have 5 years longer than men. We have several policies and programs in place. That is the national health policy, we have the national nutrition policy, the mother and child tracking system, the Indira Gandhi Matruvitva Sahyog Yojana, the central government health scheme and the national plan of action on nutrition, the national plan of action for children, the integrated child development services scheme. National Charter for Children, Balika Samriti Yojana, Kishori Shakti Yojana, Nutrition Program for Adolescent Girls, Midday Meal Program, Janan Raksha Yojana, National Food Security Mission, National Horticulture Mission, National Iodine Deficiency Disorder Control Program, Prophylactic Program, the IFA and Vitamin A and Iodine. Education. As already discussed, education has been used as an indicator for several indices in addition to Education for All Development Index, EDI and Gender Parity Index. It cuts across indices such as Multidimensional Poverty Index, Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index, Gender Related Development Index, Global Gender Gap Index, Gender Equality Index and Gender Equity Index. Let us see how India fares with regard to this very important indicator. In 2010, India ranked 102 out of the 120 countries for EDI and falls under the category of the low EDI that is less than 0 0.80 and has a score of 0 0.790 and a gender specific EFA of 0 0.865 as of 2011. 
the jet parity index in primary level enrollment was 1.02 in secondary enrollment it comes down to 0 0.94 and tertiary level further comes down to 0 0.78 while many countries are on course india needs additional effort especially the secondary and tertiary levels you should also recognize that education contributes significantly to the overall development Let's now look at India's performance with regard to education. The literacy level for 7 plus for India is 65.5 when compared to 82.1 for males as based on government of India data. Adult literacy rate 15 plus as per 64th NSS round survey report is 61.1 as of 2007-8. Enrollment at all levels from primary to PhD shows gender disparities growing wider as the level goes higher. You will also notice from the graph that all levels girls enrollment is lower than that of boys and the proportion increases with increase in the level of enrollment. Looking at the dropout rate data you will find that more girls in proportion to boys drop out of school at every level. This also has a link to gender inequalities including social and caste inequalities. There are also interstate variations. The national educational interventions need to be further strengthened. Therefore, we have several policies and programs in place and you may have a look at the uh, slide where I have indicated the programs like you have national program education, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, op Operation Blackboard, Shiksha Karmi and so on and so forth. It is the responsibility of every educational institution to ensure quality of education and campaign for equal access to education. The families and the community at large should also share this responsibility. Let's look at political participation, the Beijing platform for action took up two strategic objectives, women's full participation in decision making power structures through equal representation in governmental bodies and participation in political parties. Second, the women's capacity to participate in decision making and leadership positions through a transparent criteria for entering into decision making positions. The indicators which capture political empowerment are GEM, the GII, GGP, CG and HDI. Let us see how India compares with other countries through these indicators. Among all the three dimensions of GEM, India has a relatively better score for political participation. The score in 1996 was 0 0.573 and in 2006 India reflected an improvement and scored 0 0.625. So we are very good in political participation. If you look at global gender gap index rankings of 2014, India ranks 15 with regard to political empowerment reflecting less gender inequality with regard to political participation. India scores well on political empowerment. How and why does it look so good? In India, voters have elected women to state legislative assemblies and the national parliament. In the 2014 elections, more women than men voted. Women and men have the same right to vote and contest elections. All said and done, there is no guarantee of their effective political participation. The overriding factor is that women continue to perform their traditionally defined roles since there is no gender equity and, and domestic violence is rampant. Other barriers include low literacy levels and lack of training to take up leadership roles. It's imperative to improve the status of women within the household and eradicate illiteracy and poverty for effective political participation by women. Let's look at economic status. Globally, women's participation in the labor force is low. They also earn lower salaries when compared to men for equal work. They also have irregular jobs when compared to men, making them more vulnerable. India ranks 134 out of 142 countries, according to the World Economic Forum 2014, with regard to the global gender gap in respect of the sub-index for economic participation and opportunity, a reflection of a wide gender disparity. India is committed towards improving the economic participation of women and the several policies and programs in place starting from the fifth five-year plan onwards. The gender equity index captures the gap between women and men in education, economy 
and their political empowerment. Looking at the economic participation of women, India is at critically low level. It has achieved only 37 points out of 100 including perfect equality with Norway having achieved 89 points on gender equity. If you look at the gender related development index, India has medium human development with GDI of 132 out of 187 countries ranked for GDI. The purchasing power parity between men and women as of 2013 is 23% for women when compared to 77% for men. Multidimensional poverty index includes an inequality adjusted human development index, the loss due to inequality for India and it is 28.6%. All the indicators which reflect gender equality tell you the same story, the steep increase in the participation of the lowest strata of society in the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Scheme has made a visible change in this. They now have bank accounts and are unionized to bargain for their rights. Women's empowerment as articulated by Amartya Sen, it is imperative that women should, should not be mere recipients of benefits but become dynamic promoters of social transformation. We have learnt already that empowerment is a composite measure of women's political participation, women in economic decision making positions that is women in administrative management and professional and technical jobs and women's share of income in relation to men. The World Economic Forum has ranked India 53 out of the 58 countries for women's empowerment as of 2005. This shows that India is lagging behind with regard to several indicators which reflect women's empowerment. The GEM score for India improved from 0.416 in 1996 to 0 0.497 in 2006. Deeper analysis of the various components reveals that India's scores were the lowest with regard to women's power over economic resources. And the good news is that the situation is improving over the years as a result of the policies of the government of India. I have listed some of these uh, programs that have made a difference. Violence against women and girls. When you read the newspaper, almost every day you come across cases of violence against women covering an array of instances rape, intimate partner or non-intimate sexual violence, trafficking, female infanticide, prenatal sex selection, genital mutilation, forced marriage, early marriage, dowry violence, etc. Violence against women is best captured by the social institutions and gender index CG. As we have learnt earlier, CG is based on both quantitative and qualitative data on discriminatory social institutions in 160 countries. If you look at this map, you will find that India is appearing as one of the worst countries with regard to violence against women and girls. In recognition of these problems, India has several policies and legal provisions to protect women from violence. In spite of the stipulated legal age of marriage, India accounts for the highest number of early marriages in the world. With regard to parental authority, the right to divorce or the enforcement of equal inheritance, the practices are not favorable to women. Practices of dowry continues to exist in many parts of India. Although India has enacted the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act, the implementation has been weak. Domestic violence is on the increase. As per NCRB National Crime Records Bureau, one lakh, more than 1 lakh cases were recorded on cruelty by husbands with relatives of the husbands and the conviction was only for 15% of the cases. According to the Demographic and Health Survey, 40% of married women experience sexually, physically and emotionally abused by their husbands partners and 54% of women and 51% of men felt that domestic violence was justified. Sexual harassment is rampant in India. In spite of women's equal access to property and land, there are discriminatory practices in India reflected through research studies. Access to finance by women is very low. Not having bank accounts has been found to be an important reason. Prime Minister Modi's Banking for All can hopefully make a change provided women also create their own bank accounts. Access to credit is also low due to restricted control over collateral. Microfinance through women's groups in India has increased access to credit to women in an informal setting. 
While women are entitled to maternity benefits for 12 weeks with full pay, women in the informal sector do not benefit by this benefit. Let's now look at the India's progress on the Millennium Development Goal set up by the United Nations. Millennium Declination was made by 189 countries in the year 2000 to address the major development challenges of the world. The promise was to achieve 8 Millennium Development Goals by the year 2015. Let us look at India's progress as reflected by UNDP in the table that I have shown. In spite of various favorable policies and programs, the progress to achieve the MDGs appear to be rather slow in many spheres except gender parity in elementary education and information, communication technology and action to reverse the loss of environmental resources. These three areas we have shown mild progress. The key issues which require more attention are reducing child and infant mortality, access to sanitation and elimination of open defecation. To conclude, I would say that uh, we have understood the status of women both nationally and globally with the help of various indicators which rank the various countries according to their performance. We learned about gender parity index, education for all development index, education development index, gender empowerment measure, women's empowerment in agriculture index, gender inequality index, gender equity index, global gender gap index, social institutions and gender index, gender related development index, human development index and the inequality adjusted human development index. We try to understand the vulnerability of women through gender related indices and the dimensions of women's vulnerability. Global comparisons helped us to understand the relative progress we have made in relation to the rest of the world and what should be the thrust areas of our policy and national instruments. We also looked at the government interventions which address the multi-dimensionality of women's vulnerability. To sum up, gender discrimination can contribute to the vulnerability of countries. Gender disparities have persisted over long periods. Therefore, there is a need for consistent efforts to reduce the vulnerability of women so that they become equal partners in the national development process. There are several policy steps and interventions. There is no denial of the progress, but the pace needs to be accelerated and action to be focused, intensified and sustained. There is a need for constant review to understand the mismatches and have a new vision to expedite progress. Every woman should have the right to education, health and other related services.